morning. Welcome to Faith United Methodist Church. My name is Chuck Spoboda. I'm one of the lay worship leaders here at Faith. Today's Palm Sunday. This is the start of Holy Week. As Jesus moves from being welcomed into Jerusalem to being crucified on Calvary. Today we will hear from Faith's Chancel Choir. We will sing the story of Jesus' ministry, his life, his love, and his sacrifice. Thank you for worshiping with us today as we continue to embrace God's good love for us. Today's scripture lesson comes from Exodus 20th chapter, 17th verse, and from Romans 13th chapter, 8 through 10. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or male or female slave, or ox, or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Owe no one anything except to love one another. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Nearly everyone has heard of the Ten Commandments, the list of thou shalt nots found in the Bible. Jesus saw in these commandments not onerous burdens, but guardrails and guideposts designed to help us experience the good and beautiful life. Words that set safe boundaries, create order out of chaos, help communities live peacefully, and protect us, often from ourselves. Every thou shalt not was intended to point to a life-giving, thou shalt. These ancient words were given by a loving God who longed to protect us from harm while pointing toward the keys to a deeply meaningful and joyful life. Words of Life, reading the Ten Commandments through the eyes of Jesus. Well, again, good morning, and thank you so much for joining us here at Faith United Methodist Church. My name is Caleb Hong. I'm one of the pastors here at Faith, and today is Palm Sunday. There's a lot going on this weekend. We have a lot. Thank you to the choir for singing. Thank you to our kids for processing uh, with palms. Um, today, we are also concluding our sermon series, uh, the one we've uh, been through during the season of Lent, um, and it's a... a, 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 a a series, I realize I'm forgetting something right now. <laughs> it's a series where we're remembering uh, Jesus' ministry with us, but we're also focusing on the Ten Commandments. But before I jump into that, I do want to um, have us recite together our mission statement. Here we go. Uh, we've been doing this throughout uh, the Lenten season, so let's do this again. Let's uh, remind each other our mission and purpose. Faith, United Methodist Church, is a church family dedicated to bringing people to Jesus Christ through worship, education, mission, and fellowship. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, we will continue to remind ourselves of our mission statement. Um, again, in addition to memorizing our mission statement, we've been, we've been memorizing the Ten Commandments. And um, don't worry, <laughs> no pop quiz this weekend. Um, I, what I want to do is have you uh, see the commandments up on the screen, and we're going to say them together. If you uh, feel like you've memorized them, you can close your eyes or look away. Um, otherwise, you can just uh, follow along. So here's the Ten Commandments. You must have no other gods before me. Do not make an idol for yourself. Do not use the Lord your God's name as if it were of no significance. Remember the Sabbath day and treat it as holy. Number five, 
Honor your father and your mother. Here's the next set. Do not kill. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not testify falsely against your neighbor. And today we're going to cover this last one. Do not covet. Okay, we've got a lot to cover. Again, if you're here joining us for the first time, you haven't been with us, uh, we are in this series called Words of Life, focusing on the Ten Commandments and reminding ourselves that the Ten Commandments, they're not just this series of outdated or antiquated rules and regulations. They are God's words of life for us. They are God's uh, guideposts and guardrails so that we would experience the good life. But let's pray, and then we'll dive into today's message. We thank you, holy God, for loving us, for creating us, and inviting us to worship. So as we gather in this space together, help us to be one. Open our eyes to see, open our ears to hear, and soften our hearts to receive the gift of your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So I want us to begin by uh, reading the the fullness of the Tenth Commandment, not just a couple of words, but the entire Tenth Commandment uh, from Exodus chapter 20, verse 17. See, you'll see it on the screen. Let's read it together. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or male or female slave or ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Now, Adam Hamilton, who uh, is the author of this series that we're covering together, uh, reminds us that the word translated covet from Hebrew to English in Exodus 20:17 is the Hebrew word hamad. The word hamad, it means to strongly desire something that belongs to someone else. But even more than liking it, being attracted to it, admiring it, Hamad has this implication that you desire something that belongs to uh, someone else so much so that you'll do anything to get it. Uh, You'll sacrifice everything, including your health, your future, even your family, to get it, to take it, to have it for yourself. The Ten Commandments, uh, this Tenth Commandment then is a warning against inappropriate and unhealthy desire. This is a desire that's rooted in dissatisfaction and discontentment. And this is the kind of desire that can consume us. It causes us to lie, cheat, beg, steal, even kill. And this is what we see in King David when he coveted Bathsheba. If you remember the story, David knew that Bathsheba was Uriah's wife. Uriah was one of his own soldiers in his army. But David felt this attraction towards Bathsheba. David allowed his attraction to grow into an obsession, at which point David used his power as the king to force Bathsheba to sleep with him. And then David used his power as Israel's commander-in-chief to have Uriah killed in battle and take Bathsheba as his wife. What started off as David breaking essentially the Tenth Commandment became David breaking all the other commandments as well. Here's another example of coveting. Jacob and Esau, the twins, if you remember them, Jacob coveted his twin brother's birthright, and having the birthright as the eldest son meant you got the largest share of the inheritance David was, uh, not David, Jacob was covetous. He was jealous of this, and he wanted it for himself, so he tricked his brawny twin brother into trading his birthright for, do you all remember? A bowl of lentil stew. And I hope that lentil stew was really good, because as soon as he did this trick, Jacob spent the rest of his life running in fear from his bigger and stronger brother. Let's consider a third example of coveting. The third example I'll share comes from the story of Adam and Eve. When Adam and Eve lived in the Garden of Eden, they have access to everything. They had access to um, uh, all of Eden's beautiful trees and flowers, fruits and vegetables, waterfalls and waterways. They had access to everything except 
one thing, and that's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But instead of enjoying all that they had, Adam and Eve obsessed over what they lacked. Rather than celebrating all that was given to them, they craved that which was forbidden. And over time, this craving, this desire blinded them to all the other blessings they had, and they were so consumed by this singular desire, I imagine they started making excuses to go by that tree, to wander by that tree, to be near that tree, to look at the fruit, to touch the fruit, to smell the fruit. Finally, when a serpent suggested, why not eat the fruits, they agreed. It didn't really take all that much convincing. After this brief exchange of words, Adam and Eve exchanged paradise, this life of peace and intimacy with God, for a piece of fruit. I hope that fruit was really, really good. The Tenth Commandment, is distinct because it's a sin of the heart. It's rooted in our desire for something that doesn't belong to us, a craving that for something that is not ours to take. A covetous heart is rooted in greed, envy, dissatisfaction, discontentment, and then the opposite of co coveting is satisfaction, contentment, peace. Now, let's turn to the New Testament and consider uh, what coveting is. So you, uh, you learned uh, that the, the Hebrew word, one of the Hebrew words translated coveting is hamad. Uh, well, the New Testament is written in Greek, not Hebrew. So here's uh, one of the Greek words that can be translated as coveting or avarice or greed. And you see it up on the screen. It's the Greek word pleonaxia. Pleonaxia is a compound of two Greek words, pleon, which means more, and exo, which means to have. Pleonaxia means to constantly want more. It's this insatiable desire for more. It's this desire that is never quenched. It's this hunger that's never satisfied. You know, throughout his ministry, Jesus offered many lessons against coveting. And one of them is found in Luke chapter 12, verse 15, where Jesus says, Be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life doesn't consist in the abundance of possessions. I'm going to have us read this together. Let's read it. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. I think we have to hear this many, many times. The word translated greed in Luke 12, 15 is the Greek word pleonexia. Jesus challenges essentially this myth, this demonic lie that your life is always lacking, that you do not have enough, that you are not enough, that you can find inner peace through external possessions. You know, these days, we are bombarded with this message. This is a message that feeds into our sense of discontentment and dissatisfaction. We are inundated with commercials and ads that promise. We'll be free, we'll be happier, if only. Life will be better, if only we had that newest gadget or that latest product, like our friends. Life would be free, life would be happier, it would be better if only we had that latest car, that latest phone, that latest house, just like our neighbors. Does anyone else wrestle? Y'all hear this message? Since we're bombarded daily with this kind of message, we have to remind ourselves daily of Jesus' teaching to the contrary, because Jesus reminds us our life does not consist in the abundance of material possessions. Life is more than the accumulation of our stuff. Now let's turn to the antidotes for a covetous heart. And I want to offer two keys. Two keys to strengthen and guard our hearts against coveting. The first key is God. 
God is the key to guarding our hearts against coveting because God is the source of satisfaction in life. And I'm going to lift up a couple of passages to illustrate this point. The first one comes from the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus teaches us, do not worry. Jesus says, therefore I say to you, don't worry about your life, what you will eat or what you'll drink or about your body, what you'll wear. Isn't life more than food and the body more than clothes? Instead, desire first and foremost God's kingdom and God's righteousness. And all of these things will be given to you as well. So rather than desiring first and foremost food and clothing, cars and careers and homes, rather than having our minds be fixated and consumed by these things, Jesus says, desire God first. Desire first God's kingdom and righteousness. Seek first God's will and way. Seek first to know God and to trust God. And when you do this, you will find God is the deepest satisfaction of our hearts. The second passage I want to lift up comes from Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, chapter 55, verse 2. And here, God asks the question, Why spend money on what is not bread? And your labor on what does not satisfy. So again, the question posed to us is this. Why do we spend our lives pursuing those things that break and rot and rust? Why do we sweat and toil and spend our hard-earned income on those things that will wear out or be thrown out or be given away in a matter of weeks or months or years? Like Jesus, God is clear here in Isaiah that there's only one thing that brings us true satisfaction and true peace. I want to read all of verse 1 and 2 from Isaiah chapter 55 for us. And so God says this through the prophet, Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. Coming to the waters is coming to God. And you who have no money, come buy and eat. Why? Because we don't need money to experience God's love. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Wine and milk here are references to the hunger and thirst of our souls. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? And then here comes the answer. Listen. Listen to me. And eat what is good, and you will delight in the richest affair. The Bible is clear, Old and New Testaments, that the antidote to a covetous, discontent heart is God. It's drawing near to God and experiencing the peace and the contentment and satisfaction that surpasses all understanding in the good times and in the bad, in the times of plenty and in times of need. In fact, one of the signs of spiritual maturity, I would say, is our ability to experience peace and contentment in stressful and difficult circumstances. Because as we mature in faith, we will grow in our peace in knowing who we are and who God is and trusting in God's provision for our lives. Let's go to the second antidote, which is love. Love, as Jesus describes it, it's more than a feeling. Isn't that a song as well? More than a feel, right? But Jesus, he's the first to say it. All right. Love is more than a feeling. For Jesus, it is a way of living. Love is not just an emotion, but it's a choice. And it's a commitment to seek the good of the other. When we live a life of love, we will shield our hearts from coveting. When we live a life of love, we create like this force field, right? This uh, defense system around our hearts. When we love, we discover then the key to all the other commandments. So let's close by considering 
love's connection with the Ten Commandments. Think about the first four commandments. The first four commandments have to do with our relationship with God. So let's say those together. You must have no other gods before me. Number two, do not make an idol for yourself. Number three, do not use the Lord your God's name as if it were of no significance. Number four, remember the Sabbath day and treat it as holy. Okay, just those four is all I want to cover at the moment. Jesus summarizes these four commandments with the first and greatest commandment, which is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. All the other commandments regarding God, Jesus would say, they're tied together by the singular command to love because when we love and desire God first, we will not struggle with a covetous heart because we will be at peace with God who is the creator and sustainer of life. Now let's think about the last six commandments. You'll see them on the screen. Okay, the, let's go with number five first. Let's go back. Number five is honor your father and your mother. And then six, do not kill. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not testify falsely against your neighbor. Do not covet. And again, Jesus would summarize these six commandments with the second command. If you remember what Jesus says, that command is to love your neighbor as yourself. Because when we love our parents, we will not dishonor them. When we love our neighbor, we will not kill or murder them. When we love our neighbor, we will not sleep around with their spouse. When we love our neighbor, we will not steal from them or falsely accuse them or spread gossip or slander against them. And when we love our neighbor, we will not plot ways to take what is theirs. To love God and neighbor, this is the greatest purpose of our lives. Love is what we're made for. Love is what we're created to do. And love is what we see most clearly in Jesus, especially in this last week of his life. Love was what motivated Jesus to ride into Jerusalem on a donkey on that first Palm Sunday. Love is what drove Jesus to humble himself and endure betrayal and suffering on Maundy Thursday. Love, not nails, is what kept Jesus on the cross on that Good Friday. And then three days later, it was love that raised Jesus from the dead. It's love that defeated death on Easter Sunday. So let's close together by reading, to, uh, reading the words of Romans chapter 13. Let's read this together to close. Oh, no one anything except to love one another. For the love who one another has fulfilled the law, the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Friends, love is God's will for you and me. And love is the key to the good life. A life of joy, contentment, and peace. Let's pray. Lord, for the gift of your word that teaches us, that corrects us, that guides us, that points us to you. Thank you. Thank you for this journey that we've had through the Ten Commandments. And thank you that you lead us in this journey through Holy Week. As we remember again the story of your love, help us to see in your life what love looks like, in your humility, in your patience, in your forgiveness, in your compassion. 
Help us, Lord, this day to hear again your word, maybe for someone else, but especially for us. Help us to hear your words of love and life for us this day. Thank you for meeting us right where we are and loving us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We move now to the invitation for offering and announcements. Invitation to offer our gifts and tithes. Giving at faith is an opportunity, never an obligation. We give as an expression of our gratitude and desire to share in God's work of making disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. If you have an offering prepared for today, we invite you to place it in the offering basket at the entrance of the sanctuary. Another option would be to give online at our church website, which is, again, www.faithumcop.org. You may also give uh, electronically through your bank. And there's always the option of mailing your offering directly to the church. Here are some other ways you can share in the ministries of faith. First is Holy Week. This is Holy Week. Join us as we walk with Jesus through his suffering, death, and resurrection. There are many opportunities to worship this week, the first being on Thursday, April 14th, where we'll gather for our Maundy Thursday service at 7 p.m. The following day, on Friday, April 15th, we will gather for our Good Friday service, also at 7 p.m., and please note, both of these services will be live streamed. Then next weekend, next Saturday and Sunday, the 16th and 17th of April, we will celebrate Easter with four services. We will have our Saturday 4 p.m. service. And on Sunday, we will have three services. The first one being a 7 a.m. sunrise service. Weather permitting, this will be outside in the parking lot. Uh, weather not permitting, it will be held here in the sanctuary. We encourage that if the weather is good and you'll be coming to the 7 a.m. to bring a lawn chair to use in, in the event the service is outside. Um, we'll also have the 9 and 11 a.m. traditional services next Sunday. And both of these, the 9 and the 11, will be live streamed. Number two is the blood drive which is being hosted uh, today uh, from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. The Blood Mobile is in our parking lot and it's ready for donors. Uh, both scheduled donors and walk-ins are welcome. And as always, we thank you for sharing the gift of life. Number three, veteran pavers. The Veterans Voices Walk of Honor is ready to add new pavers this Memorial Day. If you wish to have a paver installed, either in honor of or in memory of a veteran in your life, both the order form and payment must be received by this Wednesday, April 13th. Order forms are available outside room four or online. Please contact Dale Carver for more information. Got sneakers. Our church's Eve Circle is inviting you to bring gently worn and not too stinky sneakers to church for the next three weekends. This will be running through April 9th through the 24th. Your shoes will support the work of Christmas Without Cancer, which is a nonprofit that helps families battling cancer. There's a collection bin located in the church lobby for this purpose. For our final announcement regarding puppets, we have a video. Hello. My friend and I are here to look for fun folks that can help us with the bright Sunday weekend Black Light Puppet Extravaganza. Oh yeah! Now Bright Sunday is the weekend after Easter, April 23rd and 24th. Now, there's no experience necessary. We'll have parts for all skill levels and you can help with one, two, or all three services. 
There will be a rehearsal on the evening of Thursday, April 21st. So, if you want for more information or to sign up, see us in the lobby after the services, or you can call or email me, Bob Lazars. My number and address should be in the bulletin or in the last e-blast. So, come on up, give it a try. We have lots of black light puppets and props. And remember, a puppet is a terrible thing to waste. <laughs> Let's pray over our offerings. Gracious and loving God, we offer our offerings to you with gratitude. May these offerings be used to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ and further his kingdom work of peace and mercy. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we move to our closing song, please note the closing song is going to be the Old Rugged Cross which if you're following along in, your, in the hymn book, it's hymn number 504, and we'll be singing verses 1, 2, and 4. Please rise if you are able. us of uh, worshiping and um, just the beauty 
and the sacrifice uh, that Christ offered for us. Uh, to close, uh, let's remember uh, all of the hands that help make our worship services possible. Let's thank our greeters, our ushers, Welcome Center, our security. Let's thank our AV team, our singers, musicians, our wonderful chancel choir. <laughs> our lay worship leader, and thank you so much for being here today. Uh, if you would, turn to your neighbor with a sign of a heart and say, God loves you, and so do I. God loves you, and so do I. Let me encourage you um, to take part in uh, Holy Week. If you come today and then you just come Easter, it's like reading the first page and then the last page of the book. You will miss all of this stuff in the middle. There's so much of the story um, that we need to hear and journey with Christ through. So uh, we encourage you, join us online or in person Monday, Thursday, Good Friday. Let's receive the benediction. Lord, we thank you for your love. Help us to experience, again, your grace. Help us to journey with you this holy week. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Rising, he justified, freely.